So uh, I'm excited to introduce our next speaker who comes to us all the way from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, Dr. Alan Rubin uh, earned his PhD in genome sciences here at UW in Phil Green's lab and is now working on his postdoc where he is further developing methods uh, of computational modeling of genomic data. And today he will walk us through how to assign scores to variants for our DMS experiments. Thank you, and thanks uh, to the organizers for having me out here. It's really great to attend this, be able to attend this meeting in person and um, to come back to Seattle and see uh, so many familiar new faces. Uh, so I'm going to talk about assigning scores to variants um, because that's something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. OK, so this is kind of the overview of like a mutational scan. And we're going to talk about what's going on in this middle column here, the analysis. So you know, getting, dealing with the reads, scoring the variants, dealing with replicates and stuff like that. Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about visualization. If you want to ask questions about visualization or talk about visualization, um, I would love to do that. If you want to know why gain of function should always be read, um, you know, I'm happy to defend that and talk about it. Um, but uh, in the spirit of the workshop, I thought, you know, I'd start with a few suggestions, like my sort of big picture suggestions for assigning scores to variants and doing um, DMS analysis. And I think that Kenny really covered um, a lot of the important points here already. Um, so first of all, I think people need to think really carefully before designing a new scoring method. A lot of people kind of come up with their own new thing. Um, and one of the issues with that is that, um, as we've heard this morning, now we're starting to see multiple DMSs of the same target. And you can only really put those together if you can compare the scores. So if you have two different DMSs with two different scoring methods, it's really hard. It's kind of like step zero is reanalyze all the data so that it becomes comparable. So if, as, to the extent that we can keep things in sort of a similar space, I think we should try to do that. Um, estimating variances is really important, especially for when you're combining biological replicates. Some of the, especially some of the older methods, the really simple log ratio methods don't do this but I think that it's something that everybody needs to think about because it is a really, these high dimensional data sets with a lot of variants, there's a lot of statistics involved. Um, releasing your data in a common format is important as well to enable these kind of meta analyses and just to let everybody use your data. I would love for everybody to put all of their data in MaveDB and all their old data in MaveDB. And if you want to talk about MaveDB, then come and find me or send me an email or something like that. I've got some, there's some scripts to like help enable that. Um, but whatever the common format is, there's a lot of like kind of simple table formats and things like that. Um, it's good to, to stick with the standards as they exist. And then one final thing, I don't know how many people here are um, involved in writing scientific software, but it's very difficult to show impact, not by just citation counts. So wherever possible, please, when you're writing your papers, cite the software packages that you're using in the main text, not in the supplement. The supplementary methods, those don't get tracked. And so then when we try to get funded to continue this work and, to, and importantly to support the packages, once they stop being novel, but they still need stuff done to them, like we need to have like a high citation count if we're going to have a chance of getting that continued support. So that's sort of like a plea that feels very personal for, for my future viability for doing this kind of stuff. Um, so rather than walk you through like how to do an Enrich2 analysis, um, this is not really the time for that because while Enrich2 has been awesome and really impactful, I think for a lot of people, and a lot of people have used it, and some of you have emailed me, and I really like hearing from people that are using it. So even if you have questions that you think are like not good questions, please ask me anyways, because you would, you would be surprised how informative those questions are in terms of helping me identify like what we need to do next and what are the kind of the pain points for users. Um, Enrich2 has kind of gotten to the point where for a few reasons that I'm going to get to in, in, this, in this talk, um, it needs like a fairly comprehensive refresh. So what I want to talk about today is um, what's the next thing and where it's going and what are those plans? And I'm really hoping to hear from you and your questions and also hopefully some comments. Um, what is it that we should be doing or what is it that I should be doing to help move this forward so that everybody can um, analyze their data more easily? So um, here's what, what I've learned from the time developing Enrich2 and then supporting Enrich2, um, which is it does a few things really well. So it does barcode counting really well. 
Um, and in particular, a lot of people just use Enrich2 to count, and then they use something else to design the scores uh, or to develop the scores. Um, it does a good job calling variants from, in a particular case where you have reads or barcodes mapped to variants that are full length and they're all the same length. Um, it doesn't do shock end data at all, uh, which is a problem, and it doesn't do SGE, and it doesn't handle splice sites. And so these are the, some of the things that we want to address. It also does a good job of calculating scores for growth and binding assays because that was around when we were designing it. But any of these facts-based analyses um, where you have you know, counts and bins, uh, that's not supported. And so that's one of these examples where I see people commonly counting things with Enrich2 and then moving it over somewhere else. Like I think VamSeq's a really good example where there's some really nice R, R markdown notebooks where you can go through and get all of the, all of the scores out, out that way. So we want to make it easier for people that need to develop new scoring methods, that are developing new technologies um, to not have to do as much work to get to where they need to go. Okay, uh, I've also learned some things about the, the users. This is, uh, it, I was honestly, I was very surprised to learn how many people were doing like really their first analysis project like by trying to learn Enrich2. And I apologize to those of you who have suffered through the terrible error messages that the program produces. This is something about software engineering. So as the developer, when you write an error message, you think about how you're gonna get to that point, but that's usually not how the user's gonna get to that point. So it's like when it's like, didn't find any variants because yeah, so anyway. So that's, a, that's something for, that's been really interesting to, to think about and how to take the, those lessons forward. Um, lots of people use Windows, like I am not a commonly a Windows user, but there are a lot of people out there that exclusively use Windows and a lot of the scientific libraries require you to be on Mac OS or Linux. So we do have to definitely keep that in mind to make sure to not include any dependencies that are not supported at all on Windows so that people can continue to use it and to make sure that all the GUI stuff and everything like that is really nicely cross-platform. Um, and yeah, so I said, I mentioned this already, that this counts only mode brings a lot of value and that people still do want to write their own methods. So in order to enable all of these things and move forward, um, the new project is called COUNTES, which stands for Account Based Experiments, Scores and Statistics. So what's old is that it's basically based on the Enrich2 code base. So everything that Enrich2 can do, this is going to do. And a lot of stuff is going to be shared. We're going to retain the graphical user interface, which I think has been really helpful for people. Uh, I'd like to thank Leah for convincing me that that was really necessary because she refused to hand write the JSON configuration files. I don't blame her. She was, Leah was like Enrich's, Enrich 2's like first user and helped kind of get it to where it is today. Um, so importantly, it's gonna run on Python 3.6. So those of you that follow this stuff may know that um, Python 2.7 is now officially unsupported in the end of life as of January 1st of this year. And Enrich2 requires Python 2.7. And so a lot of things need to change in order to allow us to use all of the cool new things that are happening in the scientific Python world in terms of efficiency and new features and stuff like that that are not ever gonna be backported. Um, but the two, the, I think the biggest thing is that all of the scoring and input data processing is moving to a plugin based system so that if people wanna develop a new scoring method, they, you, don't, you shouldn't have to learn anything about the internals of the code base in order to do that. It should be much easier to do that and to prototype and to, and to build new things. Um, and then also, um, I'm thinking a lot about multi-threaded analysis and support for very large data sets because I think within the next couple of years, we're gonna see this, um, this uh, collision of some of the single cell scale experiments and you know, the, the multiplex assay stuff. And um, those of you who have done a lot of data analysis know that once your data gets bigger than memory, like really bad stuff starts to happen and you start to have to jump through a lot of hoops. And we, I wanna try to future proof against that sort of thing. Okay, so it's got the same old GUI with some new stuff. So there's like a console, there's some plugins. Um, you can select your normalization method and things like that. This is like an early prototype. This is probably gonna change. Um, but basically, uh, Enrich2 had this monolithic structure where everything is inside the Enrich2 package. So all the GUI stuff, the input files, the scoring function, it's all kind of coordinated by this like 
kind of driver glue code, and then you can have outperforming and plotting routines and stuff like that. But what we're moving to is something that's more like this, where the plugins are sitting outside the package itself. And so that means that if you want to develop, add new input methods because you've developed some new technology for counting variants or new, you have some other, you know, you want to get it from some other source, um, or you want to develop a new scoring plugin, you don't have to interact with anything that's inside that box at all. And some other stuff's coming out, like the plotting library and stuff is going to come out and be its own independent thing. And then, of course, we want to have really good native support for MaveDB. Um, so an input data plugin kind of, you can have input data plugins that kind of looks like this. You provide some input data, you provide some user parameters, you provide a plugin, and then the deal is that you get variant counts. And so whatever code sits in this plugin that satisfies that end condition, which is that you're going to get a data frame of counts, is totally valid. And so, you know, we can do this for, you know, for example, these barcode variant libraries that a lot of people use where you have a barcode variant map file, and then you have some fastq files, and then you use some fastq filtering options and a wild type sequence, and all of that information goes in there, and then you get counts out the other end. Like this is the kind of uh, sort of a graphical depiction of what that looks like now. And so moving forward, um, we're going to add some new ways of doing it. So the big one is, um, is to add support for BAM files to support shotgun libraries, um, and also to add, um, there is some, also some demand to add um, variant strings. So if you already know, what, if you've already, in the course of your subassembly or whatever, if you've already figured out what the variant is for a given barcode, why does the program need to calculate that again? Can it, we just provide something that looks like a variant as part of the barcode map? So having that supported natively, I think it's going to be helpful. Um, then there's all the sort of old friends. And I'm going to drop support for this overlapping paradigm direct sequencing because it's super fiddly and people have all kinds of problems with it. And there's all kinds of other programs that do that better, like Flash, that you can just run and then get single, basically a bunch of single end reads um, that you can analyze. Okay, so in a generic scoring plugin, it kind of looks like this. You provide counts, counts go into the plugin along with some model parameters, and you get scores out. And so this is the model. Um, so anything that wants to go in that middle box is, is fine. So if we have like this sort of regression, the like weighted least squares regression scoring that Enrich2 does that a lot of people use for time series data, um, you have your counts. You have a choice of normalization, whether that's wild type normalization or library size normalization or whatever. It goes into the plugin, and then you get variant scores out. So um, I figure I'm, I'm not going to be scared to show code. Um, so here's like some prototype code for what that looks like. So we've got to calculate score functions. It takes the data store that's on disk. It takes the identifier for the keys. The identifier for the scores, some optional dictionary of parameters. Um, you get the counts out of the store. You apply some function, you know, that does the regression line by line to that data frame, and then you put the scores back, and then you're done. So, and this is this is the kind of, I don't know, the sort of prototype for what somebody could think about doing. So you can, and the upshot of this is that you can put whatever you want in this function, and you put it in a folder. And then the graphical user interface and the rest of the, of the rest of the program will detect all of the different plugins that you have, and you can just pick one. So if you want to develop a new method and you want to have five different methods that you're trying to benchmark against each other, you can do that without rebuilding the program over and over and over again, reinstalling it over and over and over again. Um, if you want to distribute it to collaborators, you can do that. If you want to you know, just develop your own new thing, you can do that. If you want to build it on an existing plugin, you can do that. So the idea is, is that it should be easier for people to stay within this program and still do their new stuff and take advantage of all the read handling and all of the replicate handling and all of those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, so this is, this, is, this is Python. This is like the new Python 3 stuff with all of like the type hinting and stuff like that that makes it a lot easier to write code. And that just makes my life as a developer a lot easier because the you can you can tell when you're passing the wrong thing around in the wrong spot. Um, yes. Yeah, so you can just change the helper function, or if you have a method that where you want to sort of share information across all of the variants, 
of course you have complete access to that as well. Um, but yeah, so that's, because that's the way that Enrich2 does stuff is it treats things very independently and a lot of the methods do that, that's, that's the example. So yeah, so if all you wanted to do is change up the helper function, like you can do that. Um, another thing that I wanted to add was a lot of people like to use R and R is really good at a lot of things and it's good at a lot of things that Python's not good at. Like I prefer Python, but a lot of people do not. Um, so there's this really nice package um, called rpy2, which essentially creates an entire R environment inside your Python environment. So the way that this would look like is, again, with the helper function, so we can import rpy2, this R objects environment, and we have our calculate scores, data, calculate scores function, which is the same as before. And then we have this helper function string. And so that's R code in a string. And then we just ask our objects to evaluate the code that's in there and return the result. And in this case, the result that's being returned is an R function because we passed in some code that defines an R function. And now that is an executable function in the Python environment. So now that thing, this helper function, is just your helper function that you're going to apply to each row of the data frame. So I think this is going to be really powerful to kind of bring everybody in because the last thing that I want to see happen is to have there be the people that do deep mutational scanning and multiplex assays in R and the people that do multiplex assays in Python and that it's like, and that it becomes tedious to, to, um, to bridge that gap. So that's, that's what we're, that's what we're trying to avoid. Okay. So there's some other stuff about the, to improve the implementation. So the big, the big thing is, I don't know how many people here like follow like data science stuff and like, you know, attend software conferences and things like that. But one of the new things is um, there's been a lot of innovation, uh, largely a lot of it from um, kind of the corporate side of things to um, improve management of very large data sets. So I think that this field is not, we're not quite there at what, you know, kind of the rest of the world would consider to be big data, but I think we are getting there like really fast. Um, and so instead of staying with pandas, which is the library that we use for using data frames and all of that kind of stuff and managing the, the files and, and everything like that, we're moving to something called Dask, which has essentially the same in interface as pandas. So it's relatively seamless, but it allows things to be evaluated in, in chunks in a very sort of seamless way. Um, it can be done lazily and you can split it across clusters and it's designed for these ultra large data sets that can never fit in memory and they need to be kind of like chunked up or sliced up in some sort of way for us to be able to, to do anything with them. Um, it also gives us some benefit, which is so some people really like the HDF5 files that Enrich2 uses and some people really don't. And I think that they're really good for some things and they're not as good for others. So moving to this is gonna allow us to, 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 there's the new program is gonna support some different backends. So Apache Parquet is one of these, you know, really high dimensional data sets that are um, data formats that's designed for like cloud computing, um, but it has some, some really nice, nice properties. And then also adding the humble CSV file as like an output format, because if you're developing a new method and a new plugin, like having to open up the HDF5 file and like look at it and then see what's there and like do it is just, is tedious. So being able to have all of the, all of the stuff natively just in CSV so you can just look at it at every step of the analysis I think is going to be helpful. Um, and yeah, and just in terms of the code, I'm trying to make the code really nice so that I can read it again six months after I write it or that other people can read it and write it and trying to just generally improve the development practices. And I'll talk a little bit about that, a little bit more about that um, here where, you know, so in Rich2, all the development happened behind closed doors. There was like a private GitHub repository that I did stuff in. And then when we published it, I was ashamed. And so I made a new repository that only had the finished version of the code and then I put that up. And so I'm not doing that this time. I think that the world has changed and that, and that it's better to do everything out in the open. So all of this stuff is, is available. Um, there's continuous integration testing and unit test coverage for everything, which I think is really important. Enrich2 doesn't really have tests, which is terrible. But um, it, the testing for Enrich2 was essentially, I re-implemented all of the core pieces of code in R and then made sure that the Python version and the R version got the same answer. So there weren't errors unless I made the same typo in two different languages, which is unlikely, but that's not great. So there's more, you know, 
uh, proper software development happening here. So, um, so there's continuous integration testing, there's co code coverage testing, and then there's a few different, there's project boards and issue trackers. I'm trying to keep everything about the project management on GitHub. So if you want to interact with this, if you have suggestions, if you have questions, please um, get in touch. Um, so this is under active development. I've written, because as much as I've told you not to reinvent the wheel, I am not immune to this. So I've written a separate FASTA and FASTQ parsing library in like modern Python that has no dependencies to sit on this and that sort of decided that that was worth spinning out of its own thing. So that's there. And I'm gonna add a new um, kind of sequence function map um, plotting and visualization library. Um, so that's everything that's going on sort of for the, for the future um, of, of this kind of stuff. So um, with that, I'd like to thank in particular Daniel Esposito, who is the main software engineer on MaveDB and also did some of the early prototyping and um, prototyping of the plugin system for what is now going to become Countess. Um, and, uh, and a, a special thank you to all of the Enrich2 users who have connected and provided feedback and used the program. Um, and with that, I would love to take any questions or hear your comments.